Good, well, good evening everyone, um, we might get started, it's just, just gone past 6.30 so hopefully won't keep you too late that way. Um, thanks for coming along to another one of our seminars and um, welcome and coming on a well balmy uh, winter's night for Christchurch I'd say. Um, and yeah, so tonight I thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, retinal detachment and sort of risk factors and sort of PVD and things. So I think the first half will be hopefully clinically pretty useful because you're all seeing people with PVDs in your clinic and, and maybe people seeing people with peripheral retinal lesions and wondering what to do with them. Uh, the second part's a bit just more about how we treat retinal detachments, which I'm sure you guys aren't going to start doing, but um, maybe you'd know a bit more about them, you know, when patients come back and, you know, maybe why we chose a certain procedure. Uh, and hopefully um, it'll just be a bit of useful information for you. Uh, and I thought we'd have a break halfway so you can go get some more food and drink because um, I think you guys haven't had enough yet. So, um, so obviously types of retinal detachment, there's a few. We're going to talk about regmatogenous, which simply means, um, regma means break, so it's due to a retinal break. But you can get tractional ones as well, you know, that's things like diabetic retinopathy um, or ROP. You can get sort of a combination of the two. And then strange things like exudative or hemorrhagic, and then there's retinoschisis ones too. So, but we're just going to talk about regmatogenous today, and that's the most common one that you'd, you'd be seeing anyway. So for uh, detachments, um, I, I think one broad category and one broad concept that I took me a while to get, um, and um, maybe you guys haven't got it yet either, uh, is that there's really two general types. There's either one where you've had a PVD or one where you haven't, and they really behave quite differently. They're different types of patients. Uh, the treatments are often a bit different. Uh, so PVD related is the typical one, the 60 year old with flashes and floaters and they come and they've got a horseshoe tear and, and that's what we see a lot of. But then you've got these unrelated to PVD ones. So they've got either a dialysis, which might be traumatic or sometimes spontaneous, or a round hole detachment, but they don't have PVD. So they're slow, slowly progressive um, detachments that uh, are maybe treated differently and perhaps often younger patients as well. And, and I'm more for myopes for the round hole detachments too. So they're quite different, different things really. So I thought I would, um, oh, and sorry, one other thing was just, yeah, so what, what do you need to get a detachment? We need three things. You need liquefied vitreous, you need traction, um, and a full thickness tear. So if you've got traction on a tear, liquefied vitreous, you can get that fluid going in and under the retina. So you really need all three. And even though these non-PVD ones don't have the PVD traction, there's usually some little bit of traction that's gone on to allow it to detach. So we've got a few questions. Uh, so we'll... Hopefully someone will be brave enough to answer. Uh, so I guess, would anyone like to describe this eye with a detachment? Uh, and I guess the main thing I want to know is, do you think this eye has a posterior vitreous detachment or not? So there's, everyone can sort of, I'm sure everyone can see the big sort of detachment. It, the macula is just off, it sort of runs about here, the, at a big bullous part here. Um, but um, Mark, we just met Mark, so you, um, I'll, I'll pick on you. Do, do you think there's a, um, a PVD in this patient, or how might you know? <coughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. So here's your tear. So what what sort of tear is that? If you were to describe it, anyone can help Mark out. Yeah, it's a horseshoe tear. Sort of. it's, it's a bit of a funny one. The flap's kind of slightly t tilted at us, but yeah, it's a horseshoe tear. So. That, by definition, means there must be PVD at, at least in that area because it's ripped and created a flap. Um, and you can see there's actually a little blood vessel crossing that flap as well. This is probably a, a little vice ring, this little um, dark thing here. So that's in the vitreous anterior. But what I want, part of what I want to say is a vice ring can sometimes be a bit misleading and it wouldn't be the way I'd typically diagnose PVD and we'll talk about that in a minute. So this person will have a fast moving detachment, flashes and floaters and they've, um, uh, they've had a PVD. So um, that's kind of one kind of general category. And I can't ask the question now because obviously I'm going to tell you this is not a PVD, but um, the reason it's not a PVD, or if they have a PVD, it's unrelated to the detachment, is uh, this is the detachment here in this patient. It's a little bit less obvious. It's, it's relatively shallow, um, so macula's not affected. Um, there's a funny little line here, which is probably a, a high tide mark where the retina detachment was for a while, and then it's progressed a bit further out to here. Um, but what you can see here is these two little round holes and this whitish sort of stuff and sort of funny pigmentary change, which is some lattice degeneration. So... This is a high myope, and so this is a myopic round hole detachment, so it's not caused by PVD. These holes just come out of the blue. Um, no one really knows why. And uh, very occasionally, um, they will cause a slowly progressive detachment. So this person doesn't have flashes, they don't have floaters. Oh, sorry, that's not quite true. They had a couple of little flashes in their superior field, which is probably just as the retina was detaching, there was just a little bit of photoreceptor um, um, 
atrophy that was leading to some flashes, but they don't have the typical flashes of a PVD. Um, but they noticed a little bit of a superior field defect getting a little bit bigger. So again, that's just those two broad categories. And I think if you've got that in your head, then um, this isn't sort of a, re although all retinal detachment is sort of urgent, this isn't a very urgent one. This, is, this would stay like this for maybe months or even years. Um, but it's still something you'd probably fix because it is getting quite posteriorly. And we'll talk a bit about, about fixing them in a minute. This just zooms in, but I don't, I think you could probably all see that pretty well anyway. So in terms of risk factors for detachment, there's, there's quite a few different things. Um, many of them aren't that common or Im that important. Um, for example, the hereditary vitreo retinopathies, that's like sticklers and Marfans, which are pretty rare but high risk for detachment. The more common things are you know, things like your myopia and lattice degeneration, and you'll all be aware that they're risk factors for detachment. Obviously, the retinal breaks, and we'll talk about different kinds of breaks. Uh, Prior surgery, particularly cataract surgery, but, but um, maybe if they had a previous vitrectomy or even previous intravitreal injections. Uh, trauma, uh, inflammation's not usually a big risk, but it's th those things like acute retinal necrosis, the viral infections where they get sort of really um, damaged retina, they can detach commonly. Uh, and the other big risk factor is uh, detachment in the fellow eye. So you've got about a 10% risk if you had it in one eye. So particularly these patients are ones that I'm always a little bit worried about whenever they've got something in the other eye or symptoms in the other eye because um, they are uh, significantly higher risk. So in terms of stratifying the risk, so now we're talking about maybe preventing a detachment uh, in someone. Um, really the key thing is, are they symptomatic or asymptomatic? Um, so and symptomatic essentially means, have they had a PVD or not? Have they had flashes and floaters? Uh, because anything in a symptomatic patient is a bit more serious, essentially. In asymptomatic patients, then we go through all these other things and look and see, you know, are they myopic? Have they had cataract surgery? What are these other risk factors? And then that might make you decide whether you might do something like laser retina pixie around the lesion to reduce the risk in that, in that particular patient. Um, so we'll talk a bit about the symptomatic ones particularly to start with. So, um, I'll ask Roberta a question. Roberta, what, uh, what, what's the answer to the first one? What percentage of patients presenting with basically acute PVD has a retinal tear? Oh, I guess it's Yeah, you can just guess. Guessing's totally fine. Exactly right, yeah. yeah. So uh, the studies um, sometimes have slightly different numbers, but around that, yeah, one in 10, one in seven patients. So um, it's, you know, pretty common if you see them with flash and floaters, you're gonna see something. So obviously you wanna look carefully. Um, and what about if, uh, well, I don't know if I have to ask. John, I'll ask John a question. Um, if they had a vitreous hemorrhage as well as um, fl new flashes and floaters, what do you think the chances of having a tear in that situation would be? Yeah, it's definitely a lot higher. It's seventy percent in that sort of patient, and that might just be a few little red blood cells. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a big dense vitreous hemorrhage. So I guess what this shows you is that um, even just knowing about vitreous hemorrhage, you're suddenly stratifying the risk, and you know there's much more risk in some patients than others. And that's what we'll sort of talk about is, is um, who's more important or who's more you should be a bit more worried about, um, and maybe follow or, or, or refer. Uh, so this study uh, was just came out this year, but I thought it was really interesting, uh, and it was a, a massive study, essentially looking at um, electronic records in multiple American um, ophthalmology practices, and they had 9,000 eyes, so huge numbers, and um, they uh, looked at people who presented with acute posterior vitreous detachment. So they said that was flashes and floaters within four weeks of being seen. Uh, and then they assessed them and saw whether they had any complications, which they called a retinal tear, a retinal detachment, or just a vitreous hemorrhage with neither of those things. Um, and they, said, they looked and said how many people had that presentation, then how many developed it later. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things I thought was the headline figure was 25% of people, so one in four had one of those complications, which I thought was a bit higher than perhaps in my experience. Um, but it might be partly where they're presenting to, so these are ophthalmology practice and not optometry practices, so it might be slightly lower. Um, maybe they had more symptoms and things because they had more complications. Uh, but I thought that was quite high. The other thing they looked at was the timing of when these complications occurred. Uh, so in this table along the top, you've got the three different complications and then the timing of them. Uh, and so uh, I suppose the, the good news is that at presentation, um, sort of around 70 to 80% of the complications were present. So for most people, when they turn up within that few weeks of their flashes and floaters, you'll find the problem. Um, but they don't all, and so somewhere between one in four and one in five patients, the detachment or tear particularly will occur um, up to six months later. 
Uh, but you can see it definitely gets less likely as time goes on. The first three months is um, when most of it's occurred. So um, I guess, again, it, it just might play into your mind about uh, when you might review these people again. So if you see someone with PVD and you think, I can't see anything here, that all looks fine. Um, just knowing that maybe there's a one in four, one in five chance there still could be something or something could happen. And so talking to them about the symptoms, about you know, whether you review them again. And again, you might base that on some of these risk factors, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, the final thing that the study, which I thought was quite useful, um, and we already sort of talked a little bit about this, is they looked at different things that might affect your risk of developing one of those delayed, any complication, and certainly a delayed complication. Um, and so having had uh, cataract surgery, they were more likely to have any complication, or lattice degeneration was twice as likely to have a complication. Um, and if they'd had previous tear or detachment in one eye, and they had this new PVD in the other eye, they were more likely 33% um, chance of one of those complications versus 21% if they'd never had any problem with their other eye. So again, you can start to see there's these common themes of if you've had cataract surgery, if you've got lattice, if you've had a problem in the other eye, um, that should be ringing, not necessarily ringing alarm bells, but making you think uh, a bit more about these patients in terms of looking really carefully and following them up or referring. This uh, is another study which came out just a couple of months later actually, and they were particularly looking at uh, delayed retinal tears in patients who presented with acute PVD, which again, they said was flashes and floaters within four weeks of presentation. And so they um, just looked at the charts of these people. They, they found about 3,000, but then they excluded lots for lots of reasons. But um, they came up with 389 who sort of fit, fitted their criteria. And then they looked to see, um, did they present later on with retinal tears and when they were followed up and, and at what time frames and, and what were the risk factors for those patients. Uh, and it was over a few years they looked at this. Um, and so, uh, again, there's a reasonably high risk of having a delayed retinal tear, so 5%. The other um, study, it was about 3 or 4%, but, you know, still a reasonable number will have a tear um, diagnosed after that initial presentation. Um, most of them within the first four months, and then the other study, again, most was in that first three or four months. Um, and the sort of slightly, um, well, sad thing, I guess, but uh, interesting thing for me was that, you know, I'd always warn people about, you know, new floaters and reduced vision and a shadow in their vision, but only a quarter of these people um, had new symptoms when they had their tear diagnosed, their delayed tear diagnosed. So, uh, again, often they're asymptomatic when these are picked up. So, um, again, it makes you think about perhaps we should be following these people up a little bit more than we, we might. Uh, and the final thing, just like that previous study, they looked at the risk factors, and again, it's sort of similar themes where lattice is a really a big risk. So. Um, a third of patients with uh, lattice had retinal tears, where if you had no lattice, it was quite unlikely. Um, and myopia again, and they found younger patients were a bit more likely to have uh, a delayed retinal tear as well. Um, which I think they worked out that it wasn't to do just with young myopes, it, they sort of separated that out. So um, I guess from that, uh, it would a um, couple of studies and also just what we sort of know a little bit about these patients. There are a few things that might uh, make you more likely to refer a patient with PVD, even if you don't find necessarily anything going on. Certainly if you find a tear or detachment, you'll almost certainly refer them, but what about other patients? And even if you don't refer them, um, which I think is reasonable in, in many of these cases, uh, at least reviewing them yourself at an appropriate time frame. So if they've got vitreous hemorrhage, we talked about a high risk of, even if it's a mild vitreous hemorrhage, of having um, a retinal tear or detachment. So probably that's the one that I would refer um, and not look after yourselves because just be a bit concerned about those ones. Um, the Schaefer sign, does it, what Schaefer sign, or do you, you guys know what that is? The, the tobacco dust or pigment. Um, I don't, I, you've probably all seen it and not, but there's just, I just had this video that I thought might um, show up quite nicely. Uh, it goes for a little while, you eventually see it. Um, so this is a you know, slit lamp looking obviously through behind the lens into the anterior vitreous, which is all sinuretic and sort of um, fibery. And then moving it back and forth, and eventually you start to see these little orangey pigment granules once we kind of get in the right spot. They shine up pretty well. I think when he does this, you see it quite a bit better. And they're showing up. Can you see them very well? Oh, you, you sort of see them there, yeah. I, I think it's the lighting a little bit. Um, so different red blood cells, which are tiny little things that don't even look really, almost don't look red, but this is sort of a, a, a clumpier orange thing. It, and supposedly, and probably it come, it's RPE coming out from um, beneath the tear. 
Um, so that's again a high risk. There could be a tear. Now if they've had cataract surgery, sometimes there can be a bit of pigment from the iris. So it's not diagnostic of a retinal tear, but it certainly makes them high risk. And from those other studies, we've looked at myopia and lattice degeneration, and certainly a fallow, the fa that fallow eye risk as well. So um, you know, I'd, I'd be thinking about seeing these patients again. And certainly when we see these pa patients in um, our clinics, and particularly the public hospital, uh, if they present with PVD to the acute clinic and they've got any of these, so this we would see again two weeks later and um, or earlier if they've got symptoms, and this you'd probably see within sort of I think in six to eight weeks and have another look. But if someone comes with a simple PVD and they don't have these risks and you've had a really good look, then you can probably discharge those ones and they can go off and, and just come back if they have symptoms. Um, so I thought slightly segueing to how do you know a PVD is even there? Um, and Examination is kind of one thing which we'll talk about, but um, how these were some other things that might tell you, or give you a clue, I suppose. <laughs> they don't tell you whether it's there or not for sure. So uh, what would, how would age help you know whether there might be a PVD or not? Just, just older, yeah. So the older you are, the more likely. So if you're 60, maybe about a third of people have it, and then when you get above 70, maybe two thirds of people are sort of having PVD. So um, uh, the trick though is with this one, because if you're myopic, it often happens a little bit earlier. So that, there's sort of a grey area of sort of 40 to 50 year old myopes where you, you might not be quite sure whether, if they had a detachment, whether it was one of these round hole ones um, or if it was PVD related, but hopefully you could tell by looking at the tear or looking to see if they really do have PVD. Um, and they've got symptoms, which is flashes and floaters, that's easy enough. And then examination, so um, you can look for the vice ring, that's often what people look for, but sometimes there can just be a little vitreous floater in front of the disc, which isn't a vice ring, but you sort of think it could be a vice ring and it's part, a partial vice ring, and so you say, yep, that's the bit of gel that's pulled off the disc. Um, but I think this is the best way to look for it. And um, uh, when you, and we'll go back to that video briefly, because you sort of do see it quite well. So when the PVD's pulled very uh, anteriorly, which it isn't always when it's complete, but usually it is. If you basically focus that slip beam all the way back, looking for the cells, and then go even further back, almost as far as you can go, get the patient to look up and down a bit, you'll often see this sort of cellophane-y sort of membrane thing, which is the posterior hyaloid face sitting there, and when you get them to look up and down, it sort of wobbles and moves, and you can sort of tell it's an intact whole face of the posterior hyaloid. So that's um, sort of 100%, you know, if you see that, you know for sure. Um, whereas a vice ring might just be a little vitreous floater and, and actually not be there. Um, so if you look at it, it's not, this um, video isn't quite designed to show this, but if I get to the right spot on it, about here, and, oh wait, that needs to go in there, it's hard to do, push play. When um, in a second the patient blinks and looks up and down, you actually see this posterior hyaloid membrane kind of um, roll through. And just down the bottom, See that sort of wavy thing there? So that's the actual posterior hyaloid face. And, and it's not that good an example of it, but you could see it in, in the right lighting and the right movement, you actually see it really clearly. So, um, so I think that's a really, that's the thing. I, if I see that, they've got PVD. If I don't see that, I'm sort of never quite as sure. Uh, and then investigation. So everyone does OCT and we, we do it too much, but um, uh, I don't know who wants to answer this one. Who thinks this person has a PVD? Some people are saying yes, some people are saying quiet, which means they're either <laughs> <laughs> too nervous or... Um, I guess it depends what you... So PVD, what I'm talking about is complete PVD. So that means the posterior hyaloid's pulled totally off the back wall of the eye. So what you see here is the posterior hyaloid coming off at the macula, um, but this is an incomplete PVD. This is PVD happening or PVD evolution. Um, so this means they don't have that PVD, so you know you can't see that that membrane up way up there um, anteriorly behind the lens, like I showed in those other pictures. So uh, if that if that's not visible, it could be because it's way up there and you can't see it. It could be because it's still totally attached. And but if you look really carefully, you can still sort of see the, the vitreous sitting on the surface uh, if your OCT quality is good enough. Um, but this picture shows you for sure that there's definitely not a full PVD. Now, more peripherally, the the, the retina, sorry the vitreous could be detached, and you could have a tear even peripherally from that detachment, but in terms of the definition of PVD, this hasn't pulled all the way off yet. So it can give you a bit of a clue sometimes. So if we sort of come back now, so we've looked at PVD and sort of diagnosing it and things, and then these are patients who have now presented with the flashes and floaters, and so what, what are these, 
and we'll talk about the specific tears in a minute and have some pictures, but w which ones are we particularly worried about in those patients? And so the classic ones, this horseshoe tear, which we saw that picture of to start with, so that they're very high risk of detachment if they weren't treated, and if they're treated, it you know, reduces right down to almost nothing. So, you know, and the reason that they're more of a risk than a, in a percolated tear, which is really the other PVD one, um, is that the vitreous is still attached to that flap, so it's still pulling, and you need that traction lifting the retina up to allow that sort of liquefied vitreous to get in under and start to start to detach it. Whereas with an operculum, you know, it's plucked that circle right off. The traction's almost always gone. Sometimes there can still be a little bit, and that's always um, hard to tell. Uh, and so you don't have that traction, so there's nothing lifting. So they can still detach, but they're much, much less likely. And um, I can't even really give you a figure, but it's, it's quoted as very, very low if you follow patients like this um, they, and don't treat them. They, um, but I would still treat all patients with an operculated tear um, because you just don't quite know whether they've got a little bit of residual traction, um, especially if the operculum is quite close to the retina. Uh, and also, our laser retina pixie that we treat them with is very low risk. It's well tolerated, and it's um, you know it, it's unlikely to cause any problem for the patient. So um, you know I think if you talk to patients about it, they're always very keen to have um, the treatment that will make it essentially no risk. Um, if you see someone who presents with acute PVD, um, flashes and floaters, but they've got some lattice or just those atrophic round holes, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, they're sort of considered asymptomatic or just pre-existing lesions. So, and that's, you have to differentiate those little round holes in the lattice versus one where there's a little operculum plucked in front of it because they're sort of two different things. Um, obviously these ones are just pre-existing, not from the traction, and, and that's from the traction from the PVD. So uh, that was the symptomatic patients, and we talked a little bit about different retinal lesions, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll show a few photos of different things, and we'll talk through a few of the other ones, so you can um, maybe get an idea of what ones are important and um, yeah, what they look like, I guess. So cystic retinal tufts, uh, to be fair, uh, these often just look like a little tear sometimes, um, if you're looking, and but they are a little bit whiter, and they... <coughs> Uh, sort of this fibrous glial tissue, sort of scar tissue, and they're sort of perhaps congenital things almost. They don't need to be at the vitreous base, they're a little bit more posterior, so they're sort of between the equator and the vitreous base. Um, and although they're very common, 5% of the population, um, they're probably a cause of around 10% of retinal detachments, but that's a large number of people and very few people get a retinal detachment, so any one of these is very low risk for causing a detachment all by itself. Uh, so that's one little thing. So this is a picture of one um, using an indirect ophthalmoscope. So that's being indented, so you can see it sort of flapping up and actually see the, see the edge of it there. Um, and then we have lattice degeneration, which you guys will see lots of all the time. Uh, and no one really knows why lattice is there. Um, it's often in myopes, but about a quarter of it's uh, not. And maybe 6% of the population have some lattice. Um, and sometimes it'll have those little atrophic holes in it, which we'll see in a minute. These up there, trophic holes. These are little RPE, areas of RPE degeneration, sort of thin retina, um, but they're not those true atrophic sort of holes. And you get that sort of whitening of the blood vessels, which is that lattice, that's why it's called lattice, the sort of crisscrossing vessels that look white. And the problem with these lesions is that the vitreous is liquefied over them and really strongly attached around them, and so that's why they are a risk um, for causing retinal detachment. So that's those. And then our different breaks or tears, um, so um, everyone recognises the classic horseshoe tear, so that definitely PVD is pulled on that. Um, these are these you know, really nice round holes in sort of latticey change. Now, sometimes it doesn't look perfectly like that white lattice crisscrossy stuff, sometimes it's just some pigmentary change and kind of a circumferential thing, but um, this is lattice with holes and there's multiple <coughs> holes all, all through here. Uh, and this is the difference where you've got the operculum. So you've got what looks like a sort of a roundish hole, but there's no lattice. Um, and you've got this little operculum sitting in front of it, which is a little bit of retina that's been pulled off. Um, so that's related to PVD, whereas these will just be pre-existing whether PVDs occurred or not. And I include giant renal tear, even though it's quite rare. And so giant renal tear is, is just a horseshoe tear, but a very large one where the breaks at the oris serrata. And so because there's no vitreous... Um, on this posterior part of it, it just flops over and like it folds over like a taco. Um, and so these need a vitrectomy to fix and the other special thing about those is if they're not from trauma then they're very likely to get it in the other eye. And so we'll often, that one we specifically will do that laser treatment all around the retina, 360 degree laser to try and prevent this happening. So if we go all the way around posterior to the aura, we sort of know that this can never be a problem for them in the other eye. But pretty rare thankfully. 
And the other lesion, which is sort of a risk of retinal detachment, again, you guys see lots of these, uh, and I did talk about it at the Christmas thing, so I won't go into it too much, but um, I might just cover a couple of the points I made. Um, but again, very common, and probably more common than that, because you only really see them if you really look hard, um, and they're quite easy to gloss over if you're just doing a cursory exam, and you guys are often not dilating people, so it's even harder to see. Um, so they're really common, um, and but really, rarely, uncommonly, are they associated with retinal detachment? I think that number's even lower in my practice. I can only think of a handful of people I've ever seen with a retinal detachment, um, a significant detachment caused by a retinal sclesis. Um, and if you look at these natural history sort of studies, um, you know they follow these people for years with retinal sclesis, and they very rarely progress. Now you'll all probably have a patient who has, and no one who has is. I know a few, but you know overall, if you think back of all the ones you see with them, there's very few that actually run into trouble with either progression of the retinal sclesis or, or detachment. So I think we get a bit worked up about them because <clears throat> they're quite big and scary looking, but um, actually they're usually um, not not sight threatening. Um, if they do cause detachment, um, that's usually, it's usually what we call a sclesis detachment, which also isn't so worrisome. So what, what are these round things here? So there is, um, just to clarify, this is a retina sclesis peripherally, and there's um, a sclesis like that overlying this area, but you sort of can't see that 3D. So there's something lifted up over the top, and these are, are deeper, these round little areas within the sclesis. Do you guys know what, what they are? So th these are the outer leaf breaks. So the, remember, the retina sclesis is the splitting of the retina. So there's that little thin layer, which you're seeing here, lifted off. Uh, but deeper down on the RPE, there's still a layer of retina because there's a, a split. And so this is this obvious thin little layer. And you often don't even see that, or even though that deeper layer is there. But if you get holes in it, these big Swiss cheese holes, then then you get these. Then it's very really obvious that there's still something there. And to get a true regmatogenous detachment, so a full thickness break, you have to get a little hole in this part and have one of these so that the vitreous fluid can go through the little hole in the inner leaf and then go down deeper down into this hole and then go through and under the retina and it's kind of a sort of a circuitous path to go. What normally happens if they get a detachment is there's fluid within that you know, blister essentially and it can sneak in under these little holes and just spread through a little bit because it's thick fluid and there's only a certain amount of it, it doesn't really spread very far and it moves very slowly. So even if there's a detachment at the edge of a sclesis, it might be something that doesn't really change or get bad very quickly as well, and you might just monitor that too. So um, again, not quite as scary as you might think, but the scary thing I think, um, and which I talked about at the Christmas thing, is that it's really hard to sometimes tell if it's a retinal sclesis or a, one of those chronic round hole myopic detachments. Um, and I won't go through all the stuff I talked about at my um, the Christmas thing, but in the end it can be hard to tell clinically, especially in some cases, and, and the best thing I think is if it's a myope and they've got something raised in the peripheral retina that looks like a detachment, it almost certainly is, and they should be referred. Um, if they're hypermetropic, it's bilateral, and they're asymptomatic, it almost certainly isn't. Um, it's going to be a, a sclesis, and you, you're fine to watch those patients. Um, symptomatic patients, again, you need to be pretty sure it's a retinal sclesis. So they might have a PVD and just have a retinal sclesis, so they might have some flashes and floaters, <laughs> and then you see this thing. Um, because obviously people with pre-existing retinal sclesis do get PVD, um, but uh, <coughs> if you're unsure, uh, then again, it's um, particularly if they've got a, a field defect, because um, these are normally asymptomatic, then um, you need to be referring those or thinking hard about referring them. And we just showed that um, the previous talk, the OCT, you can actually see the difference on OCT if you can get one out in the periphery if it's, um, if it's posterior enough. Um, so yeah, refer if, you, if they're myopic, if you think it's a retinal detachment, um, or if it's a really big retinal sclesis beyond the equator, then again, that might be one that progresses and, and be a bit more vision threatening. Uh, so yeah, so just coming back to that strategy, so we're nearly, nearly done with this part. So we've now looked at symptomatic and, and some of these lesions, and then now we've talked about asymptomatic and, and, and some of these things that might exist in an asymptomatic patient. And so which of those do you treat? Um, and you know, do you need to stratify with these other risk factors, which we've, which we've shown can be, make you higher risk of detachment? So this um, was is a very old study from 1990, well, oldish uh, study from 1998. Not, this fellow was um, a guy who, he's an ophthalmologist from I think the Midwest in America, and he lives in sort of a small rural area, and so he has all these patients that just keep coming back to him and coming back to him, and they never leave, and they're farmers, and they live in these rural areas. So he's able to follow these people for years and years and years, and he was a really good ophthalmologist, and he was very um, clever with his examination and very precise. And so he did these massive natural history studies over years of all these people, and what, hap what really happens to these people, because um, you know, we all see one or two of them, but he was seeing lots of them and over a long period of time. 
So he had 1,700 people that he saw and he found 111 tears. Um, uh, and these were asymptomatic tears just on his routine exams. And so quite a few horseshoe tears, um, but mostly they were those atrophic holes. So these are usually your myopic patients. Um, and of all of those tears, 20 progressed to a detachment, um, but they almost all of them were those atrophic myopic holes. And they were so they were slow moving, very small detachments that he, um, he didn't even treat because they weren't bad enough to require it. Uh, but three required treatment. And so even these horseshoe tears, which we think of as higher risk in a symptomatic patient, were very low risk in these patients. So uh, again, that would suggest that in an asymptomatic patient, pretty much uh, unless there's a progressive detachment happening, you're probably safe to not treat them. Although again, it's often a discussion with the patient about their appetite for the risk as well. In terms of these other lesions we talked about in asymptomatic patients, and if they don't have any other of these risk factors like myopia or, or, or a retinal detachment in the other eye, again, all th these things are so common and retinal detachments are so rare that the sort of numbers needed to treat to prevent a detachment are, are, are really high. Um, so, you know, apes in the population with lattice, but, and it's common in detachments, but there's a one in 10,000 chance of a detachment. So you'd have to treat so many people um, and there's no evidence that it does actually make a difference. And the other trouble is that if you treat a person with lattice and you, you do laser retinopexia around that, um, the trouble is that often they come back with a retinal tear but just beside that because they have this abnormal vitro-retinal adhesion sort of all around the place. And so you feel like you've treated the visibly abnormal area and have done a good job and then they still come back with a detachment and you've, it's a, a totally different area. So um, it's another reason that sort of we feel that it's generally not worth treating lattice um, in asymptomatic patients to prevent detachment. Uh, and the cystic retinal tufts, the same thing really, they're just so common and even though they do cause a lot of detachments, the detachments are rare, so the, the risk of detachment in any one is very, very low. So again, preventative treatment's not really indicated. And we've sort of all talked about that natural history study showing that many of these patients, even with full thickness retinal holes, which we would maybe think are relatively high risk of detachment, are actually very low risk and potentially can be observed over time. Although if you do treat them, then you don't have to be quite so worried about that observation, and that might be one reason for treating that you can um, you know, perhaps if the patient's not going to be good at coming for their follow-up or you know, you're not sure they're going to return, um, if you treat, you can be a little bit happier that, um, that at least that little hole that you treated will be safe. So the final part of this bit is just um, talking about these, um, if they're asymptomatic and they have some of these lesions, but what about then if they have some other risks? And, and I think if you've got 10 VR surgeons up here, they would give you 10 different answers about, um, about this, and I think you probably you might send me a patient and one day I'll do something different and something else because it does partly depend on the patient, um, maybe it depends on your mood on the day, uh, but it, these risks are still pretty low apart from this one. So this is the one set of patients where if they have, if they have any kind of tear in the other eye, I'll definitely treat them. Um, and again, there's not really good evidence. It's, um, that's more just thinking about their risk and knowing that they have such a high risk of detachment, treating any lesion will reduce it, but it, it's not gonna eliminate their risk because for instance, if you had some lattice in a patient in their second eye and you treated it, they still might get a tear somewhere else. So um, you might reduce their risk, but without eliminating it. The other thing that comes into this is if someone's had a PVD in their fellow eye, so they've detached in this eye, and then you're looking at their other eye and thinking, well, should I treat this lattice or should I treat this tear or something? If they've already had PVD, the risk is very low of them, almost zero of them developing a detachment in their eye now. So again, they're a much lower risk and you probably wouldn't offer any treatment. Uh, so that's the first bit. That's the first half. Um, does anyone have any questions about that bit so far? Or anyone like to Can ask a question? Yeah, sure. Catherine. Yeah. Does the, is the risk of a retinal detachment post-surgery, is it higher straight after and then it diminishes? Or, or what? Yes, yeah, yeah, so, um, and tears as well. So the, um, that study where they looked at um, the risk of complications after um, their, after they said cataract surgery was higher risk of any complication, that was particularly in the first three months. So anyone who was more than three months of cataract surgery, it was, it was more similar, but still slightly higher than the, just the, the standard population risk. So, I mean, the theory is that essentially mucking around in the anterior chamber of the eye leads to that vitreous detaching a little bit earlier and perhaps more aggressively, and maybe it's a bit more firmly attached and it hadn't had a, quite a chance to, and not that we're in the vitreous or, or doing anything back there, but it still gets affected by the fluctuations in the anterior chamber. Uh, and that's where you'll get your tears. So, and that would typically be in those first few months. So, so it is a lifelong risk, um, but it's, and it's pretty minor, pretty small, but um, it is definitely highest in those. So again, flash, you know, nuance it flashes and in a, some within three months of cataract surgery. Again, that I'd be sort of not ringing alarm bells, but making me think a little bit harder about them having having some pathology.
Yes. So the, yeah, the slight trick is, I mean, I was taught and used to think that PVD was a, just, just happened all at once, and, and probably it mostly does. Uh, but then um, you do see sometimes people who you think has a complete PVD and you've seen no tears, and then they come back with some symptoms and they've got a new tear, um, and you know you didn't miss it, like because it's a really obvious one and it was a really easy exam. And so the only way that can have occurred is if the jelly's detached a bit more, at least in that area. Sometimes you could have a tear, you could have an incomplete PVD somewhere and a tear cause, so maybe half the jelly's detached, or it's not quite detached in every quadrant, let's say. Um, so you get a tear there, and you go, yep, well, there's PVD there, and you might feel this PVD everywhere else, but um, actually, you, you just can't see for sure. Um, and that might be one where you look in that anterior vitreous and you can't see the hyaloid all the way forward because it's still stuck a little bit further back. And then eventually, when that last little bit occurs, it comes front and forward that you can see it. But yeah, for, by definition, a horseshoe tear, there has to be, the vitreous has to have detached, at least in that area. Yeah. Cool. Should we have a break and get some more food and drink? Second bit, I'm going to talk a little bit more about retinal detachment. So we've sort of gone through the things that might cause it, and now a little bit about retinal detachments. And again, I just thought to come back to that, that main concept of sort of PVD related versus no PVD, and, um, and that kind of determines a little bit about how we treat these patients as well. Um, and so in terms of treatment options, uh, we'll, we'll go through a few of them, um, hopefully not, not in too much detail, but just a bit of an idea about them. Um, an observation might seem a bit strange, but uh, again, that fellow Norman Bayer who I talked about, he followed these people with these sort of myopic, reasonably large myopic detachments, so not just a hole with, you know, two distomers of fluid around it, you know, like a, a quadrant of detachment. Uh, and he followed sort of 20 of these people for, for years, and um, like one or two of them progressed enough to decide on treatment. So we tend to jump quite quickly to treating those and probably still would in most patients but um, certainly observations are an option and, and, and if the patient was you know, particularly risk averse in terms of treatment uh, or maybe if they were older and treatment was going to be more difficult then, then certainly it is, it is an option but for, for most patients the retinal detachment, some, tr some treatments generally require. Uh, this is, I tried to do a sort of a it's not really to scale, but it sort of is, uh, diagram about how we treat retinal detachments. And it looks like lots of words and arrows. It doesn't look very, maybe. I have to explain it, so it's not that good. But So uh, I've, this is the types of detachments. So PVD related at this end and non-PVD down that end. And, and they're sort of, sort of two ends of the pole, really. Um, it's not quite to scale, though, because I'd say maybe these make up 5 or 10% of detachments. So there's not far less. Um, but I guess what this is meant to be showing is that although in New Zealand, and certainly in my practice, many of these patients, um, apart from these ones, are going to get a vitrectomy. Uh, if I lived in a different country or if I lived 30 years ago and was practicing, uh, maybe in patients where vitrectomy is not, places where vitrectomy is not available for resource issues, then most of these and a large number of these could also be treated with scleral buckle. You know, that's what um, Jim used to be doing and when um, you know, Alan Simpson and all these other ophthalmologists were all sort of doing a little bit of retinal detachment stuff, they were all doing, doing buckles and doing a really nice job of them. And so you can use buckles for lots of stuff. Uh, but because of vitrectomies, um, there are some advantages of vitrectomy in many of these patients, and it's available to us. We, 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 we're predominantly doing vitrectomies here. Um, you can uh, do laser retinopexy on some of these patients, so that's when you're just doing that laser around the detachment to wall it off and stop it progressing. Um, again, these are not quite to scale. I just need to make the arrows big enough to fit the writing in. But these ones are sometimes a candidate because they're slow moving and they're generally a bit smaller. And you can do that laser around them knowing that the laser will stick and create a scar before it either <coughs> progresses or changes. Whereas most of these ones, um, as soon as you get maybe two or three distromers of fluid outside that tear, um, it will push through any laser you try and do before it's had a chance to really stick the retina down. The exception to that is if sometimes people will come with a, you know, a, a, an old horseshoe tear and a chronic little detachment, maybe picked up on an asymptomatic check by you guys, um, pigment around the edge of it, and, and it's probably been here for a long time, and that's one where um, you might consider just adding a little bit of laser around it because that's an asymptomatic patient. Um, you don't really want to do a vitrectomy and give them a cataract if they don't already have one um, or have had cataract surgery, and uh, that's a very simple way to give you that reassurance that that's not going to progress. Um, and it's probably lowish risk to progress anyway because it, it hasn't and it's been there a while. And the other thing we're doing a bit more of, um, which is an oldest treatment but um, has some benefits, and I'll talk about some studies which say why it's more useful these days, um, uh, is pneumatic retinopexy, which is a... Um, a treatment we can do in our rooms rather than necessarily in theatre and, and it has some advantages. Um, so that's kind of the general schema of um, what you might do uh, and which cases you might do it for but we'll just talk a about a few of the specific things. 
Um, and despite me saying mostly it's about PVD versus non-PVD, and, and, and often that's how I'll decide how to treat these patients, there might be a variety of other things that come into play, um, you know, um, whether it's acute or chronic, what, where the breaks are, how many of them there are, are they phacic or pseudophacic, um, you know, their general health things, can they posture, can they have a general anaesthetic or a local, what, what, what can they do? So you know, all those factors might change, you know, you might go from retrectomy to scleral buckle or back um, if something um, changed here that made it um, better for one or the other. And obviously just trying to choose the best thing for the patient and the, the thing most likely to fix their detachment. Regardless of uh, what procedure you do, to some degree, and more or less, they'll, they'll, you need to do all of these things or, or, or some of them to, to make the retina reattach or prevent the retina detaching further. So the most important thing is to, to find all retinal breaks and all of these things, because if you miss one, um, for, for instance, if it was, a, say, a PVD-related tear and you've got a horseshoe tear and you treat one and not the other, well, you know there's a 50% chance that one's going to detach and you've, you've, you've not fixed it. So um, you need, really need to find all the retinal breaks and treat them all with either this cryotherapy or laser retinopexy to create that scar around it to stick it down. Um, you need to relieve retinal traction, not all of the, not in all of the treatments, but, um, and that might be removing vitreous or, or putting the buckle on. Draining subretinal fluid, so to treat a tear, you can't treat a tear directly around it with subretinal fluid around it, the laser doesn't take up, so you need to get rid of that fluid first, so you, you have to do that. Um, tamponade in the break, um, not all of the treatments do that, but some do, but um, they all um, have some sort of retinopexy or something to create, create that adhesion and scar. So essentially you're sticking the retina down onto the RPE, um, and there's that potential space in that subretinal space where the fluid can sneak through, and essentially you're trying to obliterate that by creating a scar there and sticking it down so that fluid can't sneak through there. So, so all, of them all of them do, 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 that, do that to some degree. Um, so laser retinopexy uh, is a simple office space thing just with eye drops, so it's really easy to do, um, but it's probably not that many cases are suitable for it, and we sort of already talked a little bit about which ones maybe those smaller subclinical you know, round hole detachments, particularly because if I said I'm going to do a scleral buckle, which is a very invasive procedure under GI on someone who's asymptomatic with a little, you know, peripheral retinal detachment that's maybe never going to threaten their vision, you know, and I could cause them diplopia and change their refraction and all that other stuff, um, they'd probably, you know, much prefer me to just do a little bit of laser treatment to that area and, um, and know that that's likely going to prevent progression anyway. Um, so those, those are really the three sort of ones. So if there's a little bit of fluid around an acute tear, you can try laser and you have to watch really closely and, and sometimes it'll be enough, but if it, if it isn't, then um, you might have to go to one of the other treatments. Uh, so for pneumatic retinopexy, so this is um, something we'd, well, certainly I'm thinking of doing a bit more for patients because there's some evidence that it has some advantages. Um, but again, you need to find all the breaks. The most common reason a pneumatic retinopexy doesn't work is because there was a break that you missed. Um, you don't relieve retinal traction in this one, so you don't have to do all these things to fix retinal detachment. You don't drain this yourself, but when you inject this gas bubble into the eye, which tamponades the break, the, the RPE pump pumps all that subretinal fluid away. So, um, and that's one of the theories about it working a little bit better uh, because it sort of naturally reabsorbs the fluid rather than me draining it some way um, artificially. Um, so that uh, air bubble we inject in the eye tamponades the break, and um, then we do usually cryotherapy um, which is that little probe on the outside of the eye and we're using an indirect and we push on the wall of the eye and freeze it and, and that creates this adhesion and scar around the tear. Um, so um, this is a bit more detail than you really need but um, the good thing about it is we do it in our own rooms, we don't need an anaesthetist or a theatre. Um, you can do it in theatre sometimes if you just have to but it means we don't have to be there. Um, all this equipment we have, um, we can't do it in these rooms here but certainly public we can do them. Um, what you need to do is do a paracentesis, so that's where poking a little needle into the anterior chamber, removing some fluid, because I want to inject this much into the back of the eye, and if I inject that much, it'll you know, be like an overinflated stock ball and want to kind of explode, and, and they certainly won't see anything um, uh, because you will occlude the central retinal artery. So if you remove a little bit of fluid first and then inject this, um, then you, they'll have a high pressure, but it won't be so high that it's going to cause them trouble. And then that gas bubble expands over time, so these are 100% um, gas bubbles, and so they absorb other gas into them and sort of double, so this doubles in size and this quadruples. Uh, and so that's what, you then have to get, have the patient positioning, so that's where the tear is in the retina, and that stops any more fluid going in that tear. And then, as I say, that RPE pump pumps all the fluid away, the retina goes flat, um, and then if you've done the cryotherapy, that will then just stick in that place and stick it down. Um, you can sometimes not do cryotherapy at the time, let the retina reattach, and then do some laser treatment once it's all reattached later, but I prefer to do cryotherapy at the, cry, cryotherapy at the time, because then it, you know, it's um, all done, and it can be a bit tricky doing the laser later sometimes. 
Um, so yeah, the, the key really is that person has to position quite well. So it's not just on your side, it might be you have to be at sort of 45 degrees um, and they need to do it for a few days after. So some people um, can't be quite that precise and, and, and that would be one reason you wouldn't be able to do this on some people. Oh yeah, for sure, yeah. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's sort of slight witchcraft about how this might work, and I, I don't hundred percent believe it's useful. But you get taught to do it, and and um, it's in books, so you, know, you should believe these people who who tell these things. Um, I suppose if you if you had particularly if you had a detachment that was quite close to putting the macula off, let's say, so a superior detachment, tear up the top at twelve o'clock, and the detachment's coming right down through the arcades, it's right next to the phobia. If you put a big bubble in and tamponade it and pushed up the top and just got them to be upright where you want them to be long term, it might push that fluid further south and, and detach the macula. So the theory is that if you um, put the gas bubble in and then you'd get them to go face down and that means the bubble would be right at the macula and it would sort of be, and I don't know if this really happens, but um, squeegeeing or pushing that fluid away from the macula. So it would push the fluid back up towards the tear and hopefully some of that fluid would actually come out of the tear. And then you'd slowly get them to come up like this and as they come up it'll sort of squeeze this fluid out and come out into the vitreous cavity through the tear. I don't think it really happens. But it stop, at least it stops the retina from detaching more of the macula. So you might get them to sort of do this over a few hours, you know, come from face down to the upright division that want, you want them to be in and then they'll stay like that for the rest of the time. So that's what it's supposed to do. It's steamrolling. Steamrolling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so not everyone's amenable to this. And we talked about things like positioning. It sort of depends. It's really superior retinal um, detachments um, because you can't get people to stand on their heads to have the bubble going to the bottom. Uh, not for a few days anyway. So um, there are some people where this just wouldn't be an option. And we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that. But um, it, it probably... Even 60 to 70% of rib detachments could be pneumatic, depending on how loose or tight you are with those kind of guidelines. So this is um, a study from 1990. So this is when um, scleral buckles were the main other option for treating um, detachments before vitrectomy really got going. Um, so this is a study comparing pneumatic retinopexy, PNAR, and scleral buckles. Um, and you can read that all yourself, but essentially uh, they thought there were some advantages even in back, back then um, in terms of morbidity, um, as I say, it's quite an um, invasive big thing to do a scleral buckle, you sort of open all the conjunctiva up and you sling all the muscles and you sort of muck around with things, you put a big bit of plastic by the wall of the eye and um, so certainly this pneumatic retopexy is just a very simple one bit of cryotherapy and a couple of little injections so it's much much simpler and easier on patients. Um, they felt in this study at least the vision was generally better in pneumatic retopexy patients. Um, primary reattachment means just after one procedure, so um, slightly better in scleral buckle, and, and probably that is true, but if you fail either procedure and then have another one, um, you, almost all patients get reattached regardless of what you did first. Um, it says similar complications, but I can't really believe that because um, scleral buckle has far more complications. Uh, and even though scleral buckle is less likely to cause cataract than vitrectomy, it's still more cataract in the scleral buckle group than in, um, in the PNR group. Um, but one of the keys is that you can do this pneumatic retinopexy and if it didn't happen to work, if you look at at least uh, on average these groups of patients who fail it, they still have a good visual acuity outcome once they're reattached by whatever the other procedure is. Um, so it didn't tend to adversely affect their final visual outcome, although the, the main worry is if someone was macular on and it failed and then they went macular off, of course that one person won't do quite so well, so um, that's the one where you sort of get a little bit worried. Uh, but on average they'll do just as well as a group if, you, if, if they fail. Uh, and this is a study from I think 2019, so now we're looking at, at a more recent study and now we're comparing pneumatic retinopexy, which has had a bit of a renaissance in some places, um, with vitrectomy, which is kind of now the more kind of common procedure in, in most Western countries for, for, for the standard general retinal detachments. Um, so the, it just gives the results of this because the, the detail is not that important, but um, again, the pneumatic retinopexy uh, had better vision than vitrectomy um, at 12 months. And the reattachment rate is definitely high in vitrectomy for quite a few reasons. Um, but the final reattachment rate, so once you, you, know, you fail your pneumatic, but then you get your vitrectomy anyway, is similar. Um, but one of the keys, and I, I sort of alluded to this earlier, was that the patients who, where the RPE pump pumps the fluid away in the, in the pneumatic retinopexy, rather than me draining the fluid with my little instruments during the vitrectomy, um, get less metamorphopsia. And um, you probably see 
patients who come back and I, I think I've done a good job and they're six, maybe even six, 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 nine after a macular off detachment, you think that's great, but they're just bitterly complaining of their distortion and it's and it's horrible and they feel like it's the worst eye in the world and you think you've done sort of a reasonable job and um, uh, and so anything that can reduce that I think could be quite useful um, and so that's where pneumatic renopexy maybe has a place, um, slightly better vision outcomes and, and less um, distortion. Um, so, and then obviously the other thing which you guys see lots of is these patients who do retreat me on and then they keep coming back to you saying I'm on my office and I can't see well and you change their glasses and six months later they're mad at you that you haven't done a good job and it's because their cataract's getting worse and worse and so you know there's high rates of cataract surgery and cataract progression in the, in the retreat me patients but it's pretty, um, we do inject the gas bubble and the gas bubble is sort of catarogenic um, but it's nowhere near as much as a vitrectomy. So some reasons why pneumatic is um, quite good even compared to vitrectomy, although there's some patients where you'd have to do a vitrectomy, it wouldn't even be a, um, a possibility. So these are sort of patients where you might do a pneumatic, um, so it's usually superior tears and um, detachments. If they're phacic and they don't have much cataract, that's good for two reasons. One, I don't do a vitrectomy that gives them a cataract, but also I can see clearly in the eye and make sure I can see all the retinal tears. Um, a shallow detachment just makes it easier to do the cryo. Um, if they're macular off, well they're the ones who'll benefit from this reduced distortion, so if you macular on obviously you won't get distortion anyway. Um, and if they're nearly macular off and maybe that delay of getting to theatre, because sometimes there can be, especially at the moment, delays at public hospital getting to theatre and getting these cases done. Um, if you can do a pneumatic you might um, prevent them going macular off while you're waiting for, for theatre. Uh, but there, um, and there are some patients where, with PVR, so that's sort of that scarring and thickening of the retina where um, a pneumatic wouldn't work and vitrectomy would be a much better option. Uh, so with vitrectomy, um, so again we've got to find all the breaks, uh, we remove all the vitreous, so we definitely remove the vitreous traction and, and, and that's probably partly why this is um, slightly more successful as a first surgery than a, than a pneumatic. Um, we drain subretinal fluid generally with a little instrument just through the little tear where it went in, we put an instrument in there and just suck the fluid out and then the retina deflates and so the, the, the blister deflates. We put a gas bubble in or maybe oil and, um, and again we're using laser generally or, or cryotherapy to create that um, retinal adhesion. Um, so vitrectomy ticks all the boxes, which perhaps is why it has a slightly higher um, first surgery success rate. Um, but again, it's, it's in theatre, it's a relatively expensive thing um, in terms of um, the health system. Um, we tend to do smallish gauge, which is less uh, invasive and you know, better recovery for patients. We remove all the vitreous, we have a good look around, and that's the other thing about vitrectomy in pilot, the reason that it's sort of become more popular is we get this beautiful view with these wide field viewing systems in the eye which is much better than the indirect when you're looking um, during scleral buckle. So you, you just ha almost can't miss all the pathology whereas um, scleral buckling is a bit trickier. Um, but so we drain the fluid, we put an air bubble in, do our laser and then put some sort of gas in to again tamponade and hold that closed because um, it will take a while for that laser to work and stick down properly. So that'll hold it in the long term but in the short term we need a helping hand with a gas bubble um, and depending on which one you use, it'll last a bit longer and you might want it to last longer for a variety of reasons. So vitrectomy you can do on just about anyone, but basically you wouldn't want to do it on one of those myopic patients that doesn't have a PVD because um, to try and induce the PVD in those patients, which you have to if you're doing vitrectomy, is really difficult um, and you can run into a lot of trouble. So basically any PVD related one, ones which are really bullish where a pneumatic wouldn't work, um, if there's lots of different breaks around the place where you're buckling and things would be tricky, um, if they've had previous cataract surgery, they often have small breaks and it's hard to see the periphery. It's much easier if you're doing the vitrectomy with that wide viewing system. And there are some specific things where um, a vitrectomy can deal with that the others just can't. Um, but there are complications. So it's probably about, I tell people about 1 out of 10 will have a read detachment. Um, it depends a little bit on what the detachment was like to start with. Um, raised pressure but it tends to go away, cataracts inevitable um, and because you're inside the eye you do have some of these more serious side effects potentially but they're pretty rare thankfully so um, it's not sort of a reason why you would or wouldn't do it necessarily but um, it, once you're on vitrectomy category um, compared to say a pneumatic um, you're much more, these are more likely than certainly than in those even though you're doing an injection than pneumatic. And in terms of outcomes, yeah so about 90% reattached almost always you can reattach retina unless it, they come really bad generally um, and if they keep redetaching, you can often just leave an oil bubble in the eye and sort of artificially keep it attached, although that's obviously not great vision for the patient. And most patients with a macular detachment, again depending on the duration and um, other factors, will, will achieve 612 sort of on average, um, but obviously some are, are much worse and um, occasionally you get one who does seem to do really, really well, but that distortion can be a, a real problem for them. 
And the final one, uh, sclerobuckle. So again, we've got to find all the breaks, and as I said, it's a bit trickier with this indirect and indenting. The, the patient's generally asleep for this. It's a GA in theatre, but you can do it under local, though it's uh, not that pleasant for the patient. Um, you do relieve retinal traction, but not in the same way. So you're stitching something to the wall of the eye and pushing the wall in towards the centre, and you imagine the jelly's kind of pulling in towards the centre. So if you bring the wall of the eye in, um, the tear's now closer to that sort of central force, so you're not pulling so much. Um, draining subrenal fluid you don't have to, but we might sometimes make a little hole in the wall of the eye and the fluid drains out externally. Um, tamponading the break, you can put a gas bubble in sometimes if you feel your indent from your buckle isn't enough, but really it's that buckle pushing in or the plastic that you've stitched tightly to push the wall in so that the, the RP is now against the retina and so the tear is here, so now you've brought them both together. Um, and so that's the tampon art actually, it's actually sort of forcing from the outside, whereas a bubble is kind of sort of more forcing from the inside than together. So you're doing that by stitching that thing to the wall of the eye. And again, you're doing some sort of cryotherapy or something as well. Uh, but yeah, this is in theatre, GA, you're making these big cuts in the conjunctiva, you're sort of exposing all the eye muscles, um, having a good push around, and um, so that's why GA is better. Um, and it's really fiddly and it takes me a long time because I i say 90% of my surgeries will be a trick to me and 10% might be these and so um, I find them um, more time consuming and tricky but you still get really good results with them even when it's not your favourite surgery or the one you do most commonly for the right patients because it's the right thing to do for those patients. Um, so yeah that's scleral buckle and so the ones who I think and certainly the ones I would always do this on um, if they need surgery rather than um, say laser retinal PC would be essentially these non-PVD ones so um, if they have a dialysis, if they're round holes, um, you might consider it on a fake patient with just a normal horseshoe tear where you, re they re you really don't want to give them a cataract with a vitrectomy and a pneumatic's not an option. Um, but really it's these ones, uh, the ones where there's no PVD, that this is the, 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 the best bet uh, from a technical and sort of outcome perspective. And yet, in some places, people just don't do buckles and so they have to do a vitrectomy in this scenario and um, I'd, I'd argue they're probably doing a... Um, um, a worse job for the patient because um, it's not quite the right thing to do. Uh, so there's uh, meta-analyses, so this is a big you know, groupings of studies looking at um, this is scleral buckling versus vitrectomy, um, which really is the battle of treating this great bulk of the retinal detachments that really you could do either, which which should you do or which is better, and the answer is whichever one you're, you're better at doing and you do most often really for, for most cases, and then some there's probably one's better than the other. Um, but they looked at all these things um, and came up with uh, not a lot of difference be between them to some degree. Um, so retinal reattachment, um, which is quite low, I think. Um, these, some of these are probably older studies where the rates were a bit lower to start with. Um, the overall anatomical success, so that means retina reattached, um, similar in both groups. Um, but they did say that reattachment seemed to occur uh, more commonly in the scleral buckle group. Um, and of course cataracts more likely in the vitrectomy surgery group, although um, it's obviously fixable, but another surgery with its own small risks. So yeah, then it, again it just comes back to all these other things, so it's not just PVD and non-PVD, um, and what you're good or bad at, it's what, or better or worse at, hopefully you're good at all of them, uh, but which one you prefer, but um, all these other factors might also come into play about what you decide to do in the end, and, and, and obviously chat with the patient about their preferences. So I thought I'd, now that you know what to we might choose. Uh, now you guys can tell me what we, what I would have done or what we would do to this patient. Now, um, there is, I don't know if you can see, there's a little horseshoe tear up here. Um, so this is a, these two patients came a week or two apart. This is, this patient was 52, he's a, I think a minus four myope, and he came with some flashes and floaters uh, and a infro temporal visual field defect. Uh, and uh, so here's a detachment that runs down here. So his macular still on, he's 6'6 six, six vision, uh, he's phakic, um, and he has a little horseshoe tear here. So, so everyone now knows he definitely has a PVD because he's got a horseshoe tear, he's got flashes and floaters, he's that 50 year old myope which is probably in the age group that they get PVD or start to. Um, so what, which options for surgery could you do for this patient? Yeah, so you definitely could do vitrectomy. Yeah, pneumatic you can definitely do as well. So there's because there's this one little tear and it's a superior detachment, and he's got some of those things where you might um, prefer pneumatic, I guess, because he's he's fake. He's got no cataract. He's six six, um, and he's myopic, and I don't really want to make him well have this talk about emetropia versus myopia after cataract surgery and all this other stuff. So um, 
Uh, and he's nearly met killer off, so a, a, an urgent surgery. Uh, the thing we can do quick, quicker will be better. Um, and, and technically, you could, use, you could do a sclerobuckle on this patient as well. Um, uh, but we did a pneumatic in this patient. So, um, and so this is what a pneumatic looks like. The colours all changed and funny, um, just something to do with the settings of the machine. Nothing, it doesn't, it doesn't have a hemorrhage or nothing's changed horribly. <laughs> um, but, so that's about the size bubble you get. So I think this was two days post-injecting. So we've you know, gone with, with the cryotherapy, we've cryoed and frozen around that tear to create um, an adhesion. Um, but then instantly when you take the cryoprobe away, it, it bounces back, so it doesn't stay stuck like that because the fluid just reaccumulates. So then um, you have to get the bubble in place to allow the retina to go flat, and then those two layers will come together and then they'll eventually stick. Um, so you can see he's put upright here, directly upright at a machine, and it, it, the tear was about here, so we'd be covering it that way, but we got him to tilt a little bit to the side, so it was just sitting right over the top. Um, so that's a pneumatic. So that was, you know, even in two days, you can see, again, you can sort of see where the fluid sort of came to a little bit there, but that fluid's all gone. It's like reabsorbed, you know, really quickly. Um, so that's a pneumatic. And this is a, so this is a 40 year old minus eight myope this time. Um, and he's a reporter. And he came saying, I've noticed a bit of a funny shadow outside of my vision. Um, so what do you guys think he has or and is it a detachment and what sort of detachment and is there PVD? Mm -hmm. He's pointing here? Yeah. 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 Two little holes. Yeah, so there's some little retinal holes here and there's actually two little holes here. So um, so yeah, this this could be one where you might be a bit confused about ascesis because you know he's um, it sort of looks sort of thinnish and it's a bit unusual. But um, he's got symptoms, so for, for a start, people with ascesis should have symptoms. Um, not everyone comes how they're supposed to in the book, but they shouldn't. Uh, and he's a myopen. If there's a peripheral raised retinal lesion, we, we just said that's going to be a detachment, and it, and it is in him. And he's got lattice in these two little round holes here. So he's one of these ones where. Um, despite us saying these are low risk and they should never really detach, or very rarely do, you know, he, he has, so you, you'd still see it. Um, and so he's detached, from, I think it's mainly from these two, but there are these little areas down here, which I think are maybe not holes, but thin retina. Well, they weren't, because when I treated them, I could tell they weren't. But, so he's just macular on it, it sort of just comes to here. Um, and again, this is, although it looks really scary, he might have waited a week or two and been fine, because um, this has probably just happened over you know, years, potentially even, or, or, or months and months at least anyway. But he had surgery within a couple of days anyway. Um, so what surgery do you think I did for him? Oh wait, so does he have a PVD? Or do you think he has a PVD? Or should he have a PVD? <laughs> no. So yeah, so he, he he's 40 year old myope. So yeah, maybe, well, I've seen the odd person, I think you've probably seen the odd person um, who's 40 with a PVD, but um, he, he didn't and he's not that likely to. Um, and these are round holes, so these wouldn't be caused by PVD. There's no, I know the picture's not perfect, there's no perculum in front of them, and they're in lattice, if you can't really tell. Um, so um, you could possibly do a pneumatic in him if these are the only holes and these definitely weren't, but we, I wasn't sure. Um, but it's typically done in PVD related ones, the pneumatic, and less likely in these ones. If I did a vitrectomy in him, I'd have to induce PVD, so there isn't a PVD in this patient. Um, and that's really, when you induce PVD, you need the retina stuck against the wall of the eye. So when you're inducing it, um, all I do is yank on that retina and it sort of comes with the, with the vitreous. And then you're sort of risk of pulling the retina in and creating it more tears and it's, it's not, um, not much fun. So this patient has sclerobuckle. So this is a picture of him, um, uh, I think it's about a week post-operatively. And I don't know how you see, but this is the, the buckle here. So um, you know, we've stitched this big plastic thing to the wall of the eye. Um, and created this really nice sort of indent here. And these paler areas is where we've done the cryotherapy. So that's, I treated those other thin areas in case, but when, when you cry them, you can sort of tell whether there's a hole there because there's a little sort of defect in the center of it. Um, and those ones down the bottom didn't have that, but these ones definitely did. Um, so you can see even within a, a week of the surgery, so I didn't, uh, I drained his subretinal fluid um, so because I wanted to get the retina flat, but you can see there's really no fluid there now. There maybe there's a little bit here. Um, and there's good treatment of those tears. So um, yeah, he was definitely one where a, um, a scleral buckle was the way to go. So that non-PVD, he's 6'6", he's, six, six, he's a high myope. 
Um, but yeah, as happens, he's got double vision now and he's a little bit unhappy with things, um, which is fair enough. He's happy his retina is attached, but um, you now he's got another problem we've given him to fix the other one. Um, so I haven't seen him, uh, this is only about a few weeks ago, so I'll see him soon and hopefully it'll just resolve. If it doesn't, we can take the buckle off and help him out and um, uh, my squint surgeon friends will help me potentially if I need help. Um, but you know, he was going to go blind from his detachment, so you know, he's trading one thing for another. So that, uh, that's just the two little cases to end on. Thank you for coming and listening. And I'm happy to take any questions about detachments or the first section or whatever you want to do. No, no, you leave it. So um, it's very, yeah, so after a while you don't need it anymore. That, and then, so if you've done that cryotherapy or laser retinopexy, just like the bubble can go away in the vitrectomy and the retina will stay attached if you've given it long enough with the two layers sticking together for that adhesion to occur. When you've done the cryotherapy and brought the RPE and the retina together with the buckle and you've, you've treated it, it really only needs to be there for maybe a couple of weeks. Um, but it's um, still a reasonable plava to get it out and you usually like it in for a bit longer that for a bit more reassurance. The other thing is that if you've put it around that area and maybe if you didn't treat areas where there was a problem, um, that you either didn't see or maybe or a problem would occur later, you've still got the reassurance that the, the buckle's there and it would stop it becoming a detachment later. Um, for most people, if it doesn't cause problems, so if it's not causing double vision or it doesn't sort of, sometimes they can irritate and come out later and cause irritation, so you remove them in those scenarios. Um, occasionally people just find it's a bit achy or don't like the appearance. I think that's some young market woman where sort of it's a bit visible or it still looks a bit red and they don't like it. So eventually when you're happy, it's all settled and you feel safe, you can take it out for those scenarios. But, but mostly it just stays in there and, and, and we never remove it. Anyone got any other questions? Very good. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming tonight. Thanks, John.